Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brave Storytime. My name is Lisa Karasek, and I am the Community Manager for Brave Healer Productions. With me today is one of our authors. His name is Scott Holmes, and today he is going to be reading his chapter titled um, The Accidental Buddhist, The Journey to Finding Your Heart from the book Find Your Voice, Save Your Life. Welcome, Scott, to Brave Storytime. How are you today? Hi, thank you. Doing mm -hmm. incredible. And the, awesome. the fact that I get to do this live, I, I love sharing the stories that we write. I know you find that that's the same way. I do. How did you come to be in this particular book? Find Your Voice, Save Your Life. Well, this, this is the book, and it's um, Find Your Voice, Save Your Life for Transcend Transcendent Men. We were, for a year and a half, I was trying to get a men's book together. Now, as you know, in, in Brief Healer uh, Productions, you would have 25 authors and two might have been men out of the 25, mostly women. We wanted to put together from a different, slightly different perspective from a men's voice um, because there are so few out there. We tried finding them. If you look on Amazon, if you go through all of the books, there's very few men's voices unless um, they're religious or... They have kind of that bent. So I wanted to put together those those voices to be able to show the world and especially younger men kind of that that teaching that even though you're going through a tough time, you can come out on the other side. And that's where invariably most of our men uh, and their stories came from was basically suffering and coming out on the other side and, and how they did it. I like that. I'm glad you um, spearheaded that. Thank so you. Why did you want to write this particular chapter? Well, this is my story, and it's it's really telling of, of how, um, as a child, I grew up, what I went through as an adult, young adult, and then an adult, the caregiving, and how I came out on the other side of that after... Um, uh, an awful lot of, that had gone on, a lot of loss. I was speaking to um, my best friend's mom. You know how they are. They, they they consider you one of their own kids. And she looked at me and she said, I don't know anybody else who's gone as, through as much as you have. And I, and I just love it that you have come out the other side of it whole. Uh, and where you are right now. And I, you know, for, for me, that was just like, I lost my mom about uh, two years ago. And it re really meant a lot that she could see that. So that was nice. Yeah. How did it feel to write your chapter? Well, I don't know about... Um, most authors, well, actually, most of them have said to me that it's cathartic going through the story and telling storytelling. Part of Braveheart Productions, I think, is as healers write, they also heal themselves while they tell the story. Uh, there were a lot of emotions that I had to deal with about um, growing up, about um, a lot of the traumas that I've been through with my uh, with my wife having breast cancer and then and losing my daughter. And going through all of that, and it helps heal the telling of it, finding your voice, being able to use your voice, being able to allow people to understand how you feel. Because for years, I never felt like I had one. And that's, I know it sounds funny, you and I have known each other for a couple of years, and you know, you, you know I'm not ever shy about things, but... It's really the being able to tell the, tell your needs, your wants, how you feel to those closest to you, because that's when you're most guarded. And so now I can, I can honestly say that uh, it's not that I don't care what other people think. It's just that it's, I'm, I'm much closer to who I am. And so I know when I say things, it's, it's much truer to who I am. And that's, that means the world to me. 
And that's really the most important thing of all to have that. Yeah. It's it's truly a gift. Beautiful. Yeah, I, it's it's through a lot of hard work, um, through a lot of processing, through a lot of travels. Uh, I've traveled the world. I've gone to India, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, um, all all through Europe, um, and most of the United States. And the thing I find with travel is it allows you to be you. All the worries, the cares, everything that comes off. And you deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. When you go to the grocery store at home, you're focused on shopping. You, you're you focused on your list. And you're, you're only looking at, you're not looking necessarily at the people around you. If you're shopping in France and you live in, live in the U.S., you're looking at the people. You're looking at the product. You're looking at everything there. It's an ex full experience. And it's a different um different input you you just all your senses are alive because it's different and you want to learn you want to see you want to feel and you you really connect with people on a different level entirely true i i sometimes try to find things that remind me of home but then <clears throat> buy them i still buy something totally different because i want a whole new experience great analogy thank you nicely done yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you for gifting us with the honor of reading your chapter today and for just gifting the world with your words, with your beautiful chapter. And with thank that you. said, if you're ready, I'm going to let you go ahead and read. Thank you very much. This is An Accidental Buddhist, The Journey to Find My Heart by R. Scott Holmes, a pen name. And by the way, being an author really is being my best 18-year-old self. When I was in high school as a senior, I wanted to write desperately. I wanted to be a writer. That's what I wanted to be. And I wanted to travel and I wanted to do all those things. And now at the, at the age of 60 and over, I'm doing all those things. And man, is it exciting. To the story. How did I come to be standing in a Burmese Buddhist temple in Penang, Malaysia? This is what mystics and yogis do, not some blue collar 60 year old from Brockton, Massachusetts, not some grandfather, father, widow, widow, son, brother, uncle, cousin I never knew would do something as crazy as this. And on the word of a medium channeling guides, I can't even see. Was I nuts to travel 9,000 miles to find parts of my soul? Incredible, ludicrous, unbelievable. Nothing in my upbringing prepared me for this. Dangly 10-year-old arms held a blue ribbon. I had just won for reciting all the books in the Old Testament in the basement of our small Methodist church. Sundays were Sunday school and then singing. I apologize. This is what happens when you don't have a book. And then singing in the choir for the, for the hour and a half service. All my cousins, uncles, and aunts attended as well. Sundays were family, food, and bonding. Getting dressed up in my maroon suit coat that always felt way too tight. Polished shoes that somehow never quite fit. Learning the Bible stories and being able to retell them is important, was important. So I really didn't know why. This is what was expected of the oldest of four. Duty, setting the example, fitting in. Before settling in Massachusetts, I was an Air Force brat, living in off-base housing in seven different places around the world before turning eight. Movement, change, and knowing your role in our growing family were the only constants. Mom held everything together, well, dad did his duty. Learning to make friends fast and to adapt were the keys to survival. Curiosity and taking everything in around me was how I dealt with the constant change. When we moved into the house my parents would live in for 55 years, it was like walking into a dream. My room was actually going to be my room without a little brother in it. Privacy. Place to keep my stuff and the same bed to sleep in 
for years to come. A backyard, friends I wouldn't have to say goodbye to. Stability, a welcome change to my first years on this planet. Tree houses, baseball, football, playing tag, wiffle ball, kickball, Monopoly, Stratego, Hot Wheels. Growing up in the 60s and 70s, 70s in our close-knit neighborhood of Irish, Swedish, Spanish, and Yankee, another name for so many generations in New England with so many cultural influences, no one really had another identity. It was idyllic. Even though there were four kids under one roof, we always had plenty, and plenty was enough. Grandparents and cousins in the corner store were only a bike ride away. Walking to elementary school, junior high, and then high school with our friends each day cemented lifelong friendships. Playing football, basketball, baseball created competition and bonding among the 13 boys within three years of age growing up in our three-block community. Brockton was a small city with a rich history and provided a wonderful back backdrop to the life we explored each day growing up. Graduating high school and starting our local state college to teach history were somehow tracked when I met, sidetracked when I met Maura. We had grown up not more than two blocks away, knew all the same people, went to the same schools, yet never met until one night. A house party that became a party of two. We instantly bonded over the next six months and were never apart. Late night talks in steamy cars, sharing college study time, and sharing all of ourselves. Talk of marriage became serious. Serious became immediate when, through choking gas, she told me she was pregnant. All my upbringing came to the forefront. Love conquers all. Marry. Work hard. Buy a house. Create a safe life in our neighborhood where our family could grow. I was 19 and had all the confidence that I had the answers to all the questions life could throw at me. Five years later, we had three daughters in an apartment not from our, far from our families. Sundays at Catholic Mass, and I was working three jobs so more could raise the kids, just like we had seen our parents perform. At 25, I realized I didn't even know what the questions were, forget what the answers could be. Survival, never taking a day off, wanting more for I steeled my will, building walls and created armor to wear into battle each and every day. We found a rhythm to our lives, strained as it was. Then the day our lives changed forever, Maura called me at work. Something is wrong for, with Amanda. She woke up from her nap and she won't respond. Our 15-year-old daughter was in a zombie-like state. My wife and neighbor could not get her to respond to any stimuli. Maybe at the pediatrician's office. I'm calling right now. Rushing into the overflowing waiting room, I walked over to where Amanda was being cradled by Maura. There was a slight twitch at the corner of Amanda's mouth. I immediately picked her up, alerting the staff she was starting to seize. Within five minutes, both doctors on duty and the nurse were doing what they could to calm down a grand mal seizure in a child with no symptoms or history of any disorder. We're sending her to floating hospital in Boston, Dr. Horgan said. I looked at Moore's wide fear filled eyes and knew our little girl was in real trouble. The ambulance ride into Boston at rush hour, the hours waiting and not knowing what was going on, for the first time hearing our perfectly happy, healthy daughter wailing was devastating. Thus began a 14 year struggle to maintain sanity, quality of life for our multiply handicapped youngest, but also our older two daughters, paying the rent, keeping our family together. The armor I wore grew thicker daily as I slogged through each day, not knowing how it would end. The phone ringing at two in the morning is never good. Mr. Holmes, I don't know any other way to say this, but Amanda has passed. Dozens of times we had rushed to the hospital expecting the worst after getting a call from the pediatric nursing home that took care of her. Each time Amanda would rally without fanfare 
an ambulance ride, medics working on her as they had so many times before. And Nana had stopped breathing quietly in the middle of the night with no warning. How do you survive losing your daughter? How can I con comfort my wife and my girls from this loss? How do you fill a hole that big? Life was supposed to be happily ever after. That's what every movie, every story, every song told me all my life. Why does life have to be such a struggle? How can this get any worse? Be careful what questions you ask of the universe. You may not like the answers. This feels funny on the side of my breast. Moore was getting dressed and noticed the lump. 15 years earlier, her mom had passed from cervical cancer. And those images and fears came rushing back of the torment chemotherapy had caused her mom. God, no, don't let this be happening to her. Haven't we had enough? What started as a lumpectomy turned into a mastectomy and then chemotherapy. Five years out, almost to the day, a recurrence of breast cancer. Chemotherapy followed by radiation, an FDA study, more chemo, daily pills, blood tests, MRIs, CAT scans, early morning trips into Boston, late night pills. All of this as she taught elementary school full time. Got our daughters through college, early 20 wanderings, then to weddings and grandchildren. Strength beyond measure, mixed with humor, and always, always family. I had always tried to save my family, unfurling my cape and flying to the rescue, no matter what was needed. I could not fix my wife's cancer. No matter how many trips into the hospital or how many different medications prescribed, I could not cure her. God, why do you make her suffer? I can't bear to see her in such pain. I will gladly take her place. She doesn't bear this. I was powerless to change anything that happened. I felt I had failed as a husband, the protector, the hero. I could only watch and provide comfort. Where was the God I had prayed to, grown up worshiping, trying to understand? Dad, you need to come down here quick. I think mom's dying. Struggling to get dressed from interrupted sleep and stumbling down the stairs to our makeshift hospice room. Laura was gasping for breath after not eating or drinking for 10 days, lying unconscious downstairs in a rented hospital bed. Keeping the promise Moore and I had made to one another to stay home and not a hospital. My daughter and I took turns keeping watch through the night, wondering how long a body can possibly sustain itself without nourishment. Ragged gasps were followed by that final shudder, and she was gone. Maura continued to live life on her terms, even in death. Life had taken two of those I had loved most in the world I couldn't feel anymore. Was I the God I had learned to pray to responsible? How could I look at, to him for healing? The wake and funeral were a blur of tears, heartbreak, consolaces, and kind words all failing to reach my heart. A week long trip to England with my two daughters to see their best friend and her month old child didn't bring us any closer as we were all suffering. The stop in Dublin on the way home was a way to pay homage to their mom as she always wanted to visit her grandparents' homeland. We scattered Moore's ashes on the cliffs of war with what seemed like a constant gale force wind off the water. As I look back one last time, we left as we left, a rainbow appeared where we were standing. I asked, does this happen often? The attendant replied, only a dozen times a day. And then knew we had picked the perfect spot. Showing up daily to work, trying to make sense of my new situation, not knowing when emotions would overtake me was disorienting. Days went by with fewer friends reaching out. My daughters had lives and families of their own. The cat had very little to say about the subject when asked. An empty house can be a refuge or it can be a, come a cave to hibernate in. 
being single was never a consideration before. My parents were in their 80s and still living independently. Wasn't that how life was supposed to play out? I'd taken up yoga when I turned 50 and started making old man noises just getting off the couch. When I loved my, While I loved my father, I did not want to become him at such an early age. Daily morning yoga, yoga became my refuge, settling me into the day and feeling grounded. Listening to my body with intention allowed me to start to feel again. Feelings that came up were observed rather than overwhelming. And understanding a tiny seed started growing inside as I realized this was my time to find the me I had always envisioned. I had time. Now find the drive to work at it. Paul had been the best man. And re had retired from work, as most of us know, when he was 30. Although he generally worked 17 hour, hours a day on his projects. I was turning 60 and was just going through the motions. Let's take a trip around the world like we had always talked about. Reminding me, of the, reminding me of the hours we had spoken about traveling when we were young. Six months later, we were traveling through Central Europe in an Audi SUV, making up the trip as we went along. 17 days, eight countries, dozens of church, churches, cathedrals, and castles, 2,500 miles driven, and memories to last a lifetime. On the flight home, Paul asks, so, oh, where are we going next year? Our lifelong friendship had gotten stronger and any lapses during the 30 years faded. One year later, we were on a 17-day guided group tour through Thailand, Cambodia, and the length of Vietnam. Gold-covered temples in Bangkok highlighted the magnificence of the Buddhist religion. In the Hall of the Golden Buddha, I was overcome by the power emanating from the two-foot ball Buddha figure 30 feet away. Its welcoming vibrations coursed through my body. Little did I realize I had held up our group for almost an hour as I stood transfixed, head bowed to this powerful deity. Throughout our travels in Southeast Asia, I was struck by the practices of everyday people in honoring the monks, the temples, their ancestors, and the meditations I observed. They seemed to walk with their God within them. Buddha was about enlightenment, understanding, acceptance, and unconditional love, transcending our everyday existence. I felt like I came home to a place I had never been. Still on a high after getting home from the trip, Samaha, a medium I was working with regularly, stopped in the middle of a reading and started conversing with one of my spiritual guides, telling me he needs to go to Penang to the Burmese temple. Samaha replied, I, I don't know what that means. Tell him to go collect those parts of his soul left behind. He then walked out without explanation. She shrugged, she shrugged and said, I don't understand any of this. Well, if she didn't, how the heck was I? We googled Penang and Burmese temple. Sure enough, there was only one such temple in Penang, Malaysia. Also, there is a theory that, theory that soul parts get left behind when there is violence or tragic sudden death. They seek refuge in a place of safety. All great to know, but what, am, what can I do about that? Two weeks later, an email, an email was sent to our, by the tour group company Paul and I had used. Out of curiosity, I looked up their trip to, trip to Singapore and Malaysia. Sure enough, the last step, stop on the trip was in Penang, not more than four blocks from the Burmese Buddhist temple. I was floored. This was not coincidence, as this was part, this was my spirit guides clearing the way for me to go. I asked my girlfriend if she wanted to endure a 24 hour flight back and forth, the unfamiliar food, the really hot weather, and constantly being around 30 people we didn't know. There's nowhere else I'd rather be, she said. I booked the tour and we waited nine months to take this guided tour. The flight, the hotels, the food, the travel companions were all very enjoyable and well done by the tour company. I was anxious the entire trip, but as I had spoken to our guide and explained our reason for being on the trip. On the last day, we, we would have four hours on our own, and that's when Patty and I would go to the temple. Instead, 
our guide made the group's last stop the Burmese temple. I was overwhelmed with gratitude, but he said he was honored to enable my quest. Polished marble floors swooshed as we walked in our stocking feet toward the 40 foot tall highlighted Buddha. Birds chirped in the open air temple as I stood in silence. Arms raised in anticipation, clearing myself and asking that those parts of my soul, if they belong with me to come, belong with me to come to me. In my mind's eye, I saw three golden orbs circle my head slowly, almost shyly. I entered my heart space. I was transfixed. Numb. Waking as if from a dream, my girlfriend by my side, we slowly walked back to the bus, the last to enter. Weeks after we returned, I still felt the changes within me. I was open to what the universe had in store for me. I was ready to accept where it would lead me. What could I do to make myself better? How could I help others? How could I be a better, more compassionate man? Taking Reiki courses to become a Reiki master. Night school three nights a week to learn polarity therapy. Weekend long theta healing courses. Clients needing energetic clearing and healing came to me. Coaching courses, writing courses, I recovered my teenage love of expression. Daily yoga, writing, meditations, and clearing. My habits became rituals, manifesting presence. Did I need to travel thousands of miles to find myself? I'll never know. But I learned through traveling that life is not the destination, but the journey. Happiness is not where we were headed. It is a byproduct of living a full, compassionate, and heart-centered life. Shaking off all the shoulds, facing your failures in life, accepting your imperfection, and allowing all the wonder that is a world to be seen. Seeing th life through my mind's eye, I thought I was the master of time, of outcome, of reason, and judgment. Seeing life now through my heart, I know I am a master only of me. Accepting, present, and at peace. Finally. Thank you. Thank you. I loved your chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really wanted to bring the emotion um, to it. I truly think that writing is taking a three a three dimensional object. It used to be pen and paper, and now it's a computer, and turning it into emotion and thought and imagination. And that for me is what true inspirational writing is. Mm. Definitely. Well said. So final question. How did it feel just now reading the chapter? Each time I read it, and I pr probably read it a half dozen times after it came out. I lived through those emotions again and again, I, but it's a little bit different. Those emotions used to overwhelm me. I mean, I, I, I would just be a blubbering idiot. This is from a guy who does not cry, period. And I would become a blubbering, unable to speak, unable to do anything but sob. But being able to write it and express it in such a way that people could understand it really allowed me to see my feelings as they were, it was able, I was able to understand what they were and almost, and it's almost like I could see them, experience them, but see them from where I am now. And that perception of life, I think is what really brings that peace. Beautiful. And so reading the chapter just now, that's what came? Yeah. Peace. It's peace for me. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Scott. It, you truly have a beautiful story. And everything you share was, you know, beautiful. 
I have no other word. Thank you. Do you have any last words before we finish this brave story time? Only that in the work that Lisa's doing with having authors read their stories, the re and the reason for me that collaborations are so engaging is that you have points of view. You have 20 to 25 points of view in a book. And you're going to find nuggets in every single one of them from those different people. And I would encourage those who want to be authors to write, those who are, want, to, want to understand a subject to get a collaborative book like the, like these are that Brave Healer Productions puts out because it will give you perspectives and understanding and also make allow you to make connections with the author because they are practitioners. And that truly is, is where the art in these books are. Absolutely. Cannot deny that at all. <laughs> Well, thank you, Scott. It has definitely been a pleasure with you today on Brave Story Time. Everyone, please feel free to come into the Facebook page and also on the YouTube and drop your comments, ask Scott questions. We will all be um, coming back in and replying to your comments and answering your questions. Scott, we're gonna drop the link to your book and hopefully, you know, you know, get some, get your word out there even wider. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. It's truly been an honor to to know you. Like you said, we've known each other for years. It's been an honor to to be on this journey with you. Thank you. The same. All righty, everyone. Thank you for tuning into Brave Story Time from Brave Healer Productions. We'll see you next time. <laughs>